So this chapter, chapter four, is going to cover cell structure, a uh, basic unit of life called cells. And we are going to look at our first section, which is on cell theory. A little bit of basics on, um, on um, what a cell is. And so your learning outcomes are going to be to discuss the cell theory and then describe the factors that limit cell size. Cells can only get so big. And then categorize structural and functional similarities uh, in cells. How are all cells uh, very much similar? And then in future sections, we're going to look and see how uh, different groups of organisms, the cell structure varies uh, from there. So cells were first discovered in 1665 by a scientist named Robert Hooke. Uh, and when he was looking at them, he was looking at uh, little thin sections of cork using the microscopes that he uh, worked with at the time uh, and even helped to improve. And when he looked at cork, a thin slice, he found that there was these little structures that were somewhat rectangular shaped. And they reminded him of the rooms that monks would stay in in a monastery, like where they would sleep. And those were called uh, cell, uh, cell u, cell u -li. And so this is where the name cells came from. And so uh, there were some early studies uh, in the 1800s, Matthias Schleiden and Theodore Schwann. Uh, one was a botanist, and the other one was a zoologist. And they studied uh, the tissues from these under the microscope. And they found that every time they looked at uh, animal or plant, that uh, there were cells there. Uh, so uh, this came to the inductive reasoning that uh, all, all living things must be made of cells. Uh, by the way, uh, one of the ways I remember that, who was the zoologist, uh, Schwann sounds like swan, like the bird, so that's why I remember uh, that uh, he was the zoologist and uh, Schleiden was the botanist. Study plants. So cell theory then is all organisms are composed of cells and the cells are going to be the smallest living things, the smallest units of life. Okay? Uh, and then uh, cells arise, they can only arise from pre-existing cells. You can't just make cells from nowhere. Uh, so you got to have uh, a pre-existing cell. So it, we trace life all the way back to the very beginning when uh, life first appears in the fossil record about 3.5 billion years ago. We started off as one uh, as simple single-celled organism similar to the bacteria we see today. And all living things uh, have basically arisen uh, as uh, changes in mutations in, in, uh, and changes that occur to get the life forms that we see today. But they all started from a continuous line of descent from the first living cells on the planet. Now, cell size is limited. Uh, most cells have to be really uh, very small. There are some exceptions uh, to this. But one of the things that limits uh, how big a cell can, uh, can be is that a cell, as a living thing, requires uh, materials, fresh materials to come in, like nutrients uh, and building blocks, uh, like amino acids for proteins. And the cell has to get rid of waste that's sometimes generated deep down within the cell. And the bigger you are, the harder it is to get things all the way in and all the way out. Uh, and we're talking about going all the way into the center of the cell. So it's a bit harder. So that uh, basically limits size. And there's actually a model here uh, on the bottom uh, of uh, four different cubes to model cells. And those cells were all dipped at the same time into uh, a solution. Uh, and what happens here is I think they use a pH indicator like phenothaline which changes when you go from acid to base. And so as uh, the fluid they put in there uh, began to diffuse inward, you can see how it's changing the color from pink to uh, clear. And you can see with all three, uh, the smallest cube, which has the smallest volume, actually was able to get the material almost all the way to the center in the same amount of time. So it was much harder for the larger cell to do that. So uh, what then basically can affect the rate of diffusion, which is how materials move. They just move through passive movement or diffusion into and out of the cell uh, as they move in, inward and move outward. Well, if you have more surface area on the outside, which is what you're going to have when you're smaller. When you're smaller, you're going to have a lot of surface area, a lot of skin on the outside, right? And then less volume. So you would have a lot more surface area, and that's easier to get things in. So greater surface area, faster to get in and out. Now, temperature. When you're, you're talking about diffusing, particles are 
uh, moving around randomly. Uh, and so as they're moving in, some of them are bouncing back the other way. Some of them are coming, uh, you say, inward towards the cell. But as you increase temperature, that kinetic energy of those particles is much faster. So if you have a greater temperature, then diffusion is going to be faster. Concentration gradient. Uh, if you have a greater concentration gradient, what is that? Let's say that I'm going to draw a line here. Uh, let me draw it on this side here. If I draw a line over here, and on one side over here on the left, let's say this is the inside of the cell, and this is the outside. Okay. Now, if you have some kind of a substance that has about the same amount of that substance, and I'm just drawing dots to represent particles, so the concentration is about the same on both sides, then you have no concentration gradient. A gradient means a difference. But the greater the concentration gradient is in one area compared to the other. So now I'm drawing a lot more particles here. As we start to get a bigger difference between the concentration gradient on one side and the other, the faster the diffusion is going to be. So as the concentration gradient is bigger, you're going to get faster diffusion. And then distance also matters. Uh, and here I think we should probably uh, say that there's going to be the opposite here. So I'm going to draw two arrows. Temperature goes up, diffusion goes up faster. Concentration goes up, uh, gradient goes up, then we're going to have faster diffusion. But if distance that the material has to move is increased, so let's say we have to cross a bigger barrier, then the diffusion is going to be slower. Okay, so these are factors that uh, affect, oh, let's go up here. Forgot uh, to cover surface area. Surface area gets bigger. Uh, that means you have a smaller volume, but bigger surface area, then the diffusion would be faster, like in the model uh, that we see right here. <laughs> so this shows what happens when a cell gets gets uh, bigger and they actually have one cell here and then a second cell here that is 10 times bigger. So they're using a generic word unit, so it could be micrometers or it could be a, a golf ball and a basketball, for example, whatever units here. But they're using cells, so these probably are micrometers. But we have a cell that's 10 times bigger here and this one here. And then they're looking at uh, the radius. If these are round and the radius is going to be like the distance from the middle, uh, from the center going right to the edge right there. So as the radius gets bigger, what happens to the other variables like surface area, volume? and then the surface area to volume. So generally speaking here, any one of these variables, okay, I'm just gonna call them X, are gonna be proportional to the radius raised to some power. I'm just gonna put an N there, okay? Now, as this, what this means is, is as the radius gets bigger, that variable, whether it's surface area volume, is gonna get bigger, okay? Uh, and so we start looking at the circle, not mentioned here, circumference is a linear distance going all the way around. If we look at the circumference, the circumference is directly proportional just to the radius to the one power. So that means uh, as the radius gets bigger, the circumference is going to get bigger at about the same rate, same speed. Okay. But when it comes to surface area, okay, so surface area is the variable. The surface area is going to be directly proportional to the radius squared. And what that means is as the radius gets bigger, the surface area is going to get bigger as a square of the radius. So now you're talking about as we go from a cell of small size to something bigger, the surface area uh, uh, is, uh, is going to get bigger, but by the square power. Okay, so, uh, and then they saw an example here. Let's say we have one unit here, the surface area would be 12.5. And then when we go to uh, uh, the larger cell, the surface area for this one is much bigger. It's at 12.57. When we look at the volume here, we look at the volume, and it, it is directly proportional uh, to the radius, but instead to the radius cubed. And that means the volume is going to get, for the same radius increase, so let's say we go from an increase of the one unit radius to 10 unit radius, the inside stuff, the volume, the filling thing, has gotten uh, bigger a lot faster than the, the, the surface area and uh, the circumference here, right? So as your cell gets bigger, the surface area is getting bigger, but the volume is getting bigger a lot faster, okay? And so that's a big deal. So here are some equa the actual equations. Whenever you say directly proportional, you leave out the constant here. So uh, the constant is 4 pi. That's the same regardless of how you calculate it. Uh, and now it becomes an equal sign. The constant for volume is 4 thirds pi. Uh, but you can see there's the exponent to the second power for the volume is to the third power, just like we did here. Okay, so what does this tell us here? Well, okay. 
the let's now look at volume. When the radius gets bigger, as the cell goes from a, a one unit radius to a 10 unit radius, the volume has gotten bigger. It goes from 4.189 units cubed to 4,180 units cubed. Now, it's useful to look at a ratio of the surface area, which is this last one here, to the volume. In other words, take the surface area and divide it by the volume and see what happens. When we were at one unit and we divide the surface area to the volume, we get a factor of three, okay? Or of the, an answer of three. That's your surface area to volume unit. Look what happens to the surface area to volume. Remember, the volume is getting a lot bigger, a lot faster. The volume is the bottom in this ratio, right? This is on the bottom of this uh, line, and this is on the top. So this is the numerator, the surface area, and the denominator is the volume. What happens over here if we take the new surface area divided by the new volume for the larger cell, that ratio is 10 times smaller. And what that means is that this, when we relate the surface area compared to the volume, that ratio is 10 times smaller. What that means is that there's a lot of volume in there with proportionately less surface area. So that's what we were talking about earlier. It becomes harder to exchange materials with things going in and things going out. So you can only get so big as a cell before it's just not efficient anymore. So uh, how, do, how do cells do it? Well, they'll divide. If it's a single-celled organism, it gets too big, it's going to divide, like an amoeba we'll study later. Or if it's something like a human or a tree, how are you going to get bigger? You don't get bigger with bigger cells. You just divide and make more cells. Okay. So the surface to area volume is very important. We just mentioned that earlier. Um, so um, the cells, when they're smaller, it's an advantage to be smaller. And the main reason there is going to be to exchange materials. with the environment, okay? For example, cells are gonna need oxygen. They're gonna need, and then uh, they're gonna use that oxygen during cell respiration to make ATP energy for the cell, and they're gonna make carbon dioxide, so they gotta get that out. So they gotta exchange that with the environment. Same thing with nutrients. They gotta take those in, and then they gotta get rid of other waste products. So we have to be exchanging things, and if you get larger, that surface to area volume just doesn't allow for that efficient uh, thing. So that's something that this last point is talking about here, um, that um, that the volume is going to increase much faster than the surface area. So when we go back over here, that's just another way of thinking about what we were saying here, that when you go from a smaller cell to a larger cell, that surface to area volume decreases, and it makes it real hard to exchange materials. So uh, there are some cells that are big in other ways, and uh, one of the one of them is like a nerve cell. So you see a picture there on the bottom. It's of a neuron, uh, which is a nerve cell. It's a motor neuron, and they can have a real long structure right here called an axon, and they can be up to a meter long. And so that's a pretty big cell. Uh, but overall, what's happening here, this very large cell has a lot of surface area because it's been stretched out very thinly. To use an analogy, uh, if uh, the, the way things get exchanged with the cell is the same way heat can be exchanged, right? So let's say you're very cold and your arms are spread out and you, you know, the volume of your body stays the same. Your arms are spread out and you're there, you're going, to, you're going to lose a lot more heat faster because you've extended your arms and your arms are very thin and there's a lot of surface area with your skin. What do you do when you get cold? You bring your arms in and you tuck them in and you're making uh, less surface area available to the outside. So you have the same volume, but you've made, you haven't stretched, your, you don't stretch yourself out as much. So here you're going to, you're going to, you'll have that heat loss during a cold day, it'll be a lot slower because you're exposing less surface area, right? So this is how some cells can get away with being bigger in some ways, and in this case, just get uh, very thin, and you'll have a lot more surface area. So microscopes are really important for seeing uh, cells. Uh, the fact of the matter is that uh, uh, your naked eye can see very few types of cells. Uh, I think the human egg is probably... Uh, would be about a tenth of a millimeter and is, uh, for most people, might be able to see that with just uh, the naked eye, but it would be very tiny. Think about what a millimeter is. It's like, you know, it's one tenth of a centimeter. Uh, but uh, most cells are going to be small, like uh, 50 micrometers small. This, this means micro right here. 
So uh, we were talking about prefixes in lab, uh, micro, milli, and all that stuff. So remember, a millimeter is going to be 10 to the negative 3 uh, meters. Okay, That's 1,000 times smaller. Uh, that's like saying 1 over 1,000. 10 times 10 times 10 is 1,000. So to the negative means 1 over. A micrometer is 1,000 times smaller. 1,000 means now smaller is 10 to the negative 6. So that means you would take a millimeter and break it up a thousand times smaller than that. That's pretty small. So you, 50 of those uh, is uh, or smaller would be many cell types. Okay? So what a microscope does is it allows us to be able to not just magnify, but to resolve and be able to tell when you have two little structures that they're actually two little structures. Otherwise, they would be blurred together and look like just one structure, right? So um, when... Uh, um, I was talking about, uh, for the naked eye and the human egg, about 1,000 micrometers. 1,000 of these things is going to be equal to about one-tenth of a meter, uh, of a millimeter. And that's about the limit that your naked eye can make. So again, 100, that's 100 of these micrometers, is because there's 1,000 of them within a millimeter. So 100 is a tenth of that 1,000, right? So this is about the limits of the naked eye. And this is why we need extensions of our senses like microscopes to be able to see these cells. And again, cells went pretty much escape from uh, our knowledge until they started using microscopes to look at, uh, at cells, going back to hook. Uh, so here we have, uh, there's two basic kinds of microscopes. We have light microscopes, and there's a limit to just how big you can magnify. Then you have electron microscopes, which can see uh, really tiny things, like even molecules. So a light microscope is going to be limited to the property of light and the lenses that are used. And we're going to be doing a microscope in the lab. If we haven't already done it, we'll be doing it soon. Uh, now, the, uh, the light microscope can resolve things to about 200 not micro, but nanometers. Okay, so let's go back millimeters. Let's say we have millimeters, we have uh, micrometers, nanometers is a thousand times smaller. So that's 10 to the negative nine meters. Uh, this was 10 to the negative six, that's bigger, and then 10 to the negative three. Um, and then um, you have centimeters, which is uh, 200 centimeters. So here, uh, we're talking a thousand times smaller about than what our eye can see. That's pretty good. So when we're doing microscopes, usually the light source is on the bottom, but up here in this diagram that I'm using to explain, they have the light source here. And the light source is going uh, is gonna to have a lens between, and that lens collects the light and then focuses it through your specimen. And then you're going to be here on the other side looking uh, at the image produced by the lenses. It's really, this looks kind of flipped upside down. And because the specimen that's on the slide right there is so thin, and then you uh, stain it so you can see, give it contrast, uh, you can see cells, right? And so they'll look two-dimensional, but again, the resolving power is about uh, 200 nanometers. And you usually need to provide stains. They provide color to these structures so that we can actually see them um, to provide contrast. So that's the reason for the stain. Now, once... You, you get to magnifications of maybe 1,000, 2,000 power or so. In the, on the order of 1,000 times bigger, uh, it becomes harder and harder to resolve objects uh, that, are, that are less than 200 nanometers apart. So you can theoretically magnify as much as you want with lenses. You're just not going to be able to see a clear image because uh, the light can't resolve it anymore. So what do you do? You go to an electron microscope, and this one's going to use a beam of electrons, like the ones we talked about uh, they make up cells. And these have a resolving power that is a thousand times smaller than the light microscope. So this was 200 nanometers for the light microscope, and this is 0.2 nanometers. That's a thousand times smaller. Okay? That's going to allow you to see things like even molecules and so on. And there's two kinds. There's a transmission, and then there's a scanning. And both are going to use, instead of a light, they're going to use a beam of electrons. And the beam of electrons gets shined at a specimen, except this is not light, so we're not using lenses. So we're going to uh, focus the beam of electrons through uh, magnet-type structures that can influence the path of, of electrons, uh, their charged particles. And what you're going to do is you're going to have a very thin specimen. It's called transmission because the electrons are going to go through the specimen. And then you're going to have a scanner that picks up 
the electrons, and that produces an image here. Now, we don't use uh, dyes or stains here because this is not visible light. Instead, they're going to coat the specimen with uh, metal, uh, and metals are sort of somewhat heavy, and they can cause the electrons that they're going through to be bending in certain ways, and then uh, the, the, the scanner picks that up and then produces an image for us. For a scanning uh, electron microscope, instead of giving a thin slice, you're going to make a... Uh, you're just going to coat the specimen itself, the surface of it. And so the electrons uh, get put there. They get put on your specimen. Uh, and once it hits the specimen, so your specimen's over here, instead of going through it, the surface is coated with the metal particles, and those uh, electrons are going to be scattered. Uh, and they're going to be scattered based on the contours or the ups and downs of the, the, the surface of that uh, structure. And then you're going to have uh, a scanner detector that picks that up and then puts together uh, an image for you that's three-dimensional. So the scanning is cool because it can give you a three-dimensional image. That's pretty cool. Now this is just showing the um, uh, the uh, levels of magnitude at which we might see um, in size, uh, distance-wise, that we might use these different kinds of microscopes. And the scale is a bit odd. The green bar represents the range for uh, a uh, electron microscope, and then the light microscope is the yellow bar here. And then the blue bar is the human eye, which is limited to about, as we were saying earlier, about 100 micrometers, which is about a tenth of a millimeter. And the scale is a bit weird. It's not linear. It's log scale. Okay. And they switch units on us, so that makes things a little more confusing. They start off at meters up here, and then meters, meters, meters. Then they go centimeters, millimeters, and so on. But let's just relate this to the meter itself. So here's where your one meter is here. And we're going to put it in um, factors of 10. So if we're at uh, one meter, that's like saying 10 to the zero power. Any number to the zero power is one. Okay. So that's 10 to the zero power. And then we have 10 meters. That's saying 10 to the one power, just 10. And then 100 meters, that's 10 to the two power. If we go the other way here at 10 centimeters, that's uh, that's a decimeter. That's not one centimeter, it's 10 centimeters, so that's 10 to the negative one meters. So this is meters instead. Okay, that's the unit. And then we just go on down the list. Okay, one centimeter, that's 10 to the negative two. That matches what we learned about the metric prefixes. One millimeter is 10 to the negative three or a thousandths, and then 100 micrometers is 10 to the negative 4 uh, meters, uh, and then we just keep going down uh, following this pattern. 10 micrometers is 10 to the negative 5. 1 micrometer, micro means a millionth, that's 10 to the negative 6, 1 over a million. Uh, and then you keep going down here, and ultimately you're going to get to 10 to the negative 10. 10 times smaller than a billionth of a meter. There's an old school unit called the angstrom. And the unit symbol is like that with a little circle on top of the A. So that would be angstrom uh, down here. That's why they have an A there. Uh, and then if we were to do a log base 10 for this scale, we did a little bit, a little bit of logs in the lab dealing with uh, uh, acids and bases. The log is just the answer. The answer to the log of 10 to the 2 is just the exponent. So this would be 2, which is like saying 10 to the second power. This would be 1, 0, negative 1. There's a relationship there to the pH scale we were talking about earlier using logarithms. Uh, although this is, has nothing to do with concentration, this is distance, right? This would be negative 2, that would be what the log is, right? Negative 3, negative 4, negative 5, negative 6. It's just like saying it's the same thing, it's just in a log scale. So I'm putting equal signs here. And so this is log scale of the distance in meters. This is uh, the exponent, uh, base 10 of meters, and then this is the scale that they came up with. And so you can see here, down here, we're using an electron microscope to see atoms, molecules like proteins, viruses, <laughs> cells, and then you get to the light microscope where you might be able to see some organelles like mitochondria, chloroplasts, uh, red blood cells. Here's your human egg, about the limit at which the human eye can see all on its own, which is about right there. And then some other organi uh, microscopic organism found in pond water. Here's a frog egg, here's a chicken egg, and then here's a human here. So it's just kind of comparing the range at which we would use uh, different scopes or the naked eye to see things. So what are some structural similarities for cells? Uh, all cells are going to have an area where there's DNA. Okay? 
And if it's a eukaryotic cell, you might have heard that maybe in, uh, in your uh, ninth grade biology class, they're going to have a nucleus and other organelles that have membranes in them. If it's a bacteria, they're going to have DNA, but it's not in a nucleus. It's called a nucleoid region. Now, whether you're bacteria or a eukaryotic cell, you're still going to have a cytoplasm. So the cytoplasm is what fills inside the cell membrane. It's described as a semi-fluid matrix. And there's going to be the organelles and the fluid, the, the cytosol. So the cytoplasm is made up of the organelles and the fluid, the cytosol. And that combined is this uh, overall matrix that's uh, semi-fluid. And then you're going to have ribosomes. So whether you're a bacteria or a eukaryote, you're going to have uh, ribosomes, and those are the protein factories. Those are the ones that make proteins. There are some differences between the bacteria. There are smaller ribosomes. Uh, but they're not membrane organelles that we're going to learn later. All immune cells are going to have a plasma membrane. And the plasma membrane, the structure of the plasma mem membrane, we learned in the biochemistry uh, chapter. The last chapter is made of a phospholipid bilayer. Phospholipid has these two fatty acid tails with a polar head there. And they basically uh, line up where the polar head is on uh, the outside because on the outside and the inside of a cell, is a water-based environment, and the fatty acid tails are hydrophobic. They don't like water, so they line up, the tails line up in the middle. In section two, we're going to look at prokaryote cells or prokaryotic cells, uh, and your learning outcomes for this section. And uh, Prokaryotic are uh, oftentimes what we call bacteria, uh, but they also include uh, a very ancient uh, or what would appear ancient line of bacteria or prokaryotes that we call archaea or archaebacteria. Uh, and so what we're going to do is you're going to look at the organization of the prokaryotic cell. When we compare that to eukaryotic cells, which I mentioned briefly in the prior section, they're going to be smaller. They're going to be about at, on an order, uh, on average, about 10 times smaller than eukaryotic cells. And they're going to be relatively simpler in uh, structure, but that doesn't mean the process that go on in there are simple. Uh, so there's structure in there, and then there's processes. Uh, and so uh, when we look at these uh, uh, structures, it's going to be helpful for you as a student to sketch, uh, and then sketch and label, and then see if you can do that from memory. Uh, that way you know the structure because that's where learning the biology starts. You've got to learn the structure and then within there, then you've got to learn processes that occur. So as biology students, we would have a hard time learning a process if we don't know the structure. So always sketch, label, and then practice seeing if you can recreate those sketches. So that's a good way, a good strategy for learning. Uh, your second objective here would be uh, to distinguish between bacterial and archaeal cell types. Uh, so there's two different kinds of prokaryotic cells. So basically these are relatively simpler organisms. They're going to lack a membrane-bound nucleus. So when we talk about a nucleus in the cell, we're referring to a eukaryote. Prokaryotes do not have that. Instead, learn this vocabulary where it's called a nucleoid region, where they'll have a relatively large DNA, and it's going to be circular. So if we were to take that... Uh, uh, that DNA out. Imagine if you had a real long extension cord, like one of those outdoor uh, orange ones, and you connected uh, the ends together, and you have this one big loop, and it's really big, and then you gotta, and you just twist it up and coil it up, and uh, that DNA there, it is circular, uh, and it's going to be coiled up, and the region that it's located within helps keep it somewhat organized. Is going to be called the nucleoid region. So uh, keep that uh, that term in mind. There's a difference between nucleoid and then nucleus for eukaryotes. Um, we're going to have a cell wall. So that's an important structure. And the cell walls for any cell are always going to be outside the plasma membrane. So when we come over here uh, and we look at this diagram, here's the the uh, plasma membrane, and then here's the cell wall. Some bacteria are going to have a gelatinous or uh, kind of like jello, but not really, but a gelatinous uh, uh, capsule on the outside, and there you can see that uh, right there. And then they'll have little hair-like structures here. An individual, what is called a pilus, plural would be pili, uh, and those have various functions like adhering or sticking to structures that they're on. Uh, and then some will have flagella, which will be used for moving around. Now, uh, getting a little bit ahead of, of this, but that's some of that basic structure that you want to sketch and start uh, uh, learning there. So remember, plasma membrane on the inside, but it would be surrounding all of the, the cytoplasm. Cytoplasm is going to have a nucleoid region, and we are going to have ribosomes. Those are those red dots that are within there. 
which you see in that area there, to make proteins. They're not going to have membrane-bound organelles. So the key here is not. They are going to have ribosomes, but ribosomes, although they're organelles, they don't have a phospholipid membrane. Uh, and the organelles we're going to see in eukaryotes later, they're going to have phospholipid bilayer of membrane, just like the plasma membrane. And so there's a lot more complexity in there. So there's going to be two domains for prokaryotes. There is the archaea. And uh, these guys are sometimes referred to as the extremophiles. Files comes from the word phylos, which means love, and then extreme environment. So many of them will be found in like very hot temperature environments or acid environments, things like that. Things that are uh, most life forms wouldn't be able to survive in there. And then you have the common bacteria, which are found everywhere. They're on your tabletops, they're on your skin, they're on doorknobs. So we have a normal flora of bacteria all over us. There's that same image, just a bit larger. Uh, just a quick review there. You've got your plasma membrane, your nucleate region inside with your circular DNA. Those red dots are your ribosomes. Then you'll have your cell wall on the outside. Uh, and then some may have a capsule. And then there's uh, these hair-like structures called pili or pilla singular and then a flagellum there. Uh, so uh, the cell wall, which we saw in the prior drawing. The cell wall is going to be made of a structure that is a combination of sugar and uh, small chains of amino acids. So it's called peptido. Remember the peptide bonds and the polypeptide from the prior chapter and then glycan, the root there, glycose means sweet, uh, sugar. Uh, so it's a peptidoglycan. Uh, and this provides uh, structure and helps protect the bacterial cell, uh, cell. Other kinds of organisms, animals don't have cell walls. So like we don't have cell walls for our cells, but plants, uh, these are eukaryotes, fungi, and some protists are also gonna have cell walls, but their cell walls are made of a different uh, kind of material. They're usually sugar or sugar-based material, complex carbohydrate. Uh, like if you're writing notes right now on paper during this lecture, you're writing on uh, the material that uh, plants use to make their cell wall, which is called cellulose. Uh, it's just a complex carbohydrate. We talked about that in the prior chapter, chapter three. Uh, so the function of the cell wall, okay, which is made of peptidoglycan, you should know that term there, peptidoglycan is what it's made of. Uh, that cell wall uh, is to protect the cell, help it maintain shape, and to prevent the excess of in, uh, intake of water. If the bacteria is in an environment that's pure water, water is going to go in by osmosis, and without the cell wall, the if you get too much volume of water in there, your cell will burst, just like if you blow up a balloon too much. Uh, some antibiotics are going to work uh, to prevent the bacteria. So when it comes to antibiotic, the relevance to helping us uh, when we get sick, the antibiotic disrupts the bacteria's ability to make the cell wall, so that causes these bacteria to lice or to burst open and kills them. Um, the archaea have cell walls, but it's not made of peptidoglycan. So to say you lack peptidoglycan doesn't mean that the archaea do not have cell walls. Their cell walls are just made of some other kind of complex carbohydrates. Bacteria do have the flagella, uh, and so do eukaryotes. But the flagella that we see in bacteria or prokaryotes is much simpler in structure. Uh, and it's going to be used for locomotion or moving around. And it's going to be spun. So rotary motion is pretty interesting here. So let's say this is the outside of the bacterial cell. And over here on the other side, this is the inside of the bacterial cell. And you can see the phospholipid bilayer there. There's your plasma membrane. So the cytoplasm is on the inside here. So you can see that the flagella itself is made of, uh, of some filament proteins uh, that are relatively stable. Uh, and then a hook-like structure. And all of this is proteins. Okay? It looks very machine-like, like a human made it. But if you look at it, it's, these are molecules just put together in a very highly organized way. And so this part right here is this part right here, the flagella. And then when we look at a cross-section through the, the, plas the cell wall and plasma membrane, it's what we look at here. Uh, and so this is the outside part here. If you look here at the structure, here's the outer membrane. You're going to have your... Uh, your peptidoglycan cell wall, some bacteria are going to have this outer membrane-like structure. And then here's your actual major cell membrane here. What happens here is that the living bacterium is going to pump a bunch of protons uh, to right outside the membrane. And then those protons, because it's kind of like compressing a whole bunch of stuff on one side, they're going to want to come across. But because they're charged, this is something we talked about earlier, Ions cannot just cross through the plasma membrane because ions love water. They're hydrophilic, but the center of the membrane right here 
those fatty acid tails, they're hydrophobic. So things can't just cross through there. So instead, the protons are allowed to move in uh, through little channels in there. And as those protons are moving, they cause this system here to rotate or to spin. So that kinetic energy of those protons moving in creates the spinning motion that causes the propeller to move. Now, I would like you to pay a little bit of attention to this here and remember it, remember it, because when we go to uh, the mitochondria, which is used to make ATP and R cells and plant cells and so on, these are the membrane-bound organelles. They have a very, very similar motor-like structure that they use in, uh, in the protein that's used to make ATP. So think about that. Keep it, uh, file it, and we're going to come back and see a very similar mechanism. This is just showing it larger and then how the bacteria might move in this spinning type motion there. So in this section, we're going to look at prokaryotic cells and uh, compare them with, uh, uh, we're going to look at the eukaryotic cells and compare them with the prokaryotic cells. Uh, and so your learning outcomes for this uh, section are to uh, do that, to compare those two, the eukaryotic and prokaryotic, and then discuss the role of the nucleus. Uh, in the eukaryotic cells, and then describe the role of ribosomes in protein synthesis. Now, here's a, one way to think about these learning outcomes. If you are taking notes, one strategy at the end is to write a summary of what the notes were covering. And so these could be sort of like prompts to write yourself a summary that gives the big ideas from what the notes were about. So that's something that could be done. In fact, that would be an active uh, strategy that is used in a style of note-taking called Cornell Notes, where you write a summary at the end. So that's the way you can look at these uh, learning objectives. Now, when we look at eukaryotic cells, a big deal or big difference is that you're going to have a nucleus now, which is bounded by a membrane. And the membrane, it's a phospholipid bilayer. Okay? Uh, we'll see that it actually has two, uh, it's a double mem uh, bilayer membrane. Uh, and so eukaryotic cells are going to be more complex. They're going to be larger. They're going to be about 10 times larger on the average. And a big, big deal here is something called compartmentalization. So the eukaryotic cell is larger and is going to have other kinds of organelles that you don't see in a prokaryotic cell. And those organelles are also bounded by bilayer membranes, phospholipid bilayers. Uh, and so those membrane-bound organelles that we see in eukaryotic cells. So we're going to see, we're going to refer to those as our membrane-bound organelles. Those allow us, uh, the cells, to separate the kinds of processes that are occurring within the cell. So you compartmentalize. You might make proteins that you're going to export out of the cell in this compartment, whereas you'll make other kinds of proteins just in the cytoplasm. Uh, and many of those uh, membrane-bound organelles are part of what's called an endomembrane system, which we'll cover in a future section there. Uh, our eukaryotic cells are going to possess a cytoskeleton. And here you're going to have, uh, and the cytoskeleton itself, is, uh, it's a term associated with uh, cells, is going to help the cell maintain structure. The cytoskeleton also helps move things around within the cell and so on. And the cytoskeleton is going to be made out of uh, three major types of protein fibers. Okay? And we'll talk about those later. Uh, and it sort of forms this support system and a network of transport system within the cell. So here is a basic animal cell. There is no cell wall there. You can see the nucleus here colored in purple. It does, it's actually a double membrane. So you can see the two membranes there. There's one blue one on the outside and one on the inside. There's pores there that allow things to go in and out. You have your nucleolus. All of these are going to be covered in more detail later. You can see that the outer membrane of the nucleus is continuous with this outfolding which makes an organelle called the endoplasmic reticulum. And this one is rough endoplasmic reticulum. And then that may can be continuous with the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. And then uh, from the, the endoplasmic reticula, the membrane can actually bud off with materials there and then be transported to the Golgi apparatus. And then there, that's another membrane-bound organelle. The functions of these are going to be covered in the, in the future section. So since they're going real fast, don't worry about it. We're going to come back to them. You can have other kinds of organelles like lysosomes. They're used for digestion, peroxisomes, uh, which have other function. Um, you can see the protein fibers in there. Uh, you're going to have uh, different kinds of protein fibers, microtubules in green. Uh, you're going to have these very thin fibers uh, called micro uh, uh, filaments and then intermediate filaments, all part of the cytoskeleton there. And then, of course, 
your mitochondria in red there with their two membranes inner one folded there. Uh, and the mitochondria is where ATP is generated. Uh, and then, of course, your plasma membrane, your cell membrane is a phospholipid bilayer. Uh, and then some uh, uh, structures that may be associated uh, with increasing surface area like microvilli. And now if we compare this to a plant cell, one big difference that we're going to see here is, uh, and so big differences from a plant cell and the animal cell from before, is you're going to notice there's going to be a large membrane-bound structure called a central vacuole, where things may be stored, like water um, and other materials might be stored within there. you got your cytoplasm there. You're still going to have mitochondria for making ATP, but you're also going to have chloroplasts, these green structures here with photosynthesis, where food is made, sugars are made for the plant itself. You have the same endoplasmic reticulum there, your Golgi apparatus here. Uh, and, and plants are going to have a cell wall, which is going to make your typical plant cell look more rectangular in shape. Uh, if we peel away the cell walls, which are colored in green here, you're going to see that there is a plasma membrane. Remember the cell wall I mentioned earlier uh, with prokaryotes, the cell wall is always outside of uh, the plasma membrane. And it, it serves the same function as it did in prokaryotes. It's going to help maintain the shape of the cell, help provide structural support for the cell, and can help keep the cell from bursting open if too much water gets in uh, due to a process called osmosis. The cell walls themselves are going to be made out of a complex carbohydrate called cellulose, which we studied in the prior chapter. Uh, and it is much different than the peptidoglycan we see in the cell walls of uh, plant cells, I mean of uh, bacteria cells, prokaryotes. So looking at the nucleus, uh, so here's that same picture of the animal cell, and then they're just hot. They faded out everything else so we can focus on the nucleus there. And then here's the nucleus removed, looking at it more large there. And so what do we find in the nucleus? This is where we're going to find your genetic information. Your genetic information is stored in your uh, DNA. So repository means for storage, uh, that term right there. Uh, and so... Uh, most eukaryotes are going to have, uh, eukaryotic cells are going to have uh, one nucleus. Some do have two. In fact, some cells in your body have more than one nucleus as well. There's going to be a dark uh, staining body that's on the inside called the nucleolus. That's another structure to know. And this is going to be an area where there is DNA there that is responsible for making the uh, molecules that make up ribosomes. Ribosomes are going to be what uh, where protein synthesis takes place. In seventh grade, your teacher might have called it the protein factory, the ribosomes. The ribosomes are made of ribosomal RNA, which we also can just abbreviate as rRNA. And ribosomal RNA is part of what makes a ribosome. So you might just remember a quick reminder that the nucleolus is where ribosomes are made. Not the entire ribosome, but where a big part of the component is made of. The membranes of the nucleus, it is two phospholipid bilayer, so it's a double bilayer. And you can see the two layers, pointed them out in the, in the prior section there. There's going to be an outer membrane, and then there's going to be an inner membrane. And the outer membrane is going to be the one that will fold outward to make the, um, or continue with the endoplasmic reticulum on the outside. Uh, there's going to be nuclear pores that we see right there, and the nuclear pores allow things to go in and out of uh, the nucleus. Uh, for example, if we're going to make ribosomes here in the nucleus, then uh, the ribosomal RNA, uh, the ribosome itself, needs to be able to get out of the nucleus uh, there. So the DNA that's found within there is going to be linear, okay, not circular like we see in the prokaryotes I mentioned earlier. So they're linear, and so you're going to have more than one uh, linear piece of DNA. Humans, for example, have 46. They come in 23 pairs, and they're all linear. And when they coil up uh, during cell division, we call those chromosomes. This is the DNA with some proteins that help organize uh, that. So that DNA with uh, the protein is going to be referred to as chromatin. Okay? And the chromatin, when coiled up very tightly, becomes chromosomes. Okay? So, so DNA plus protein that helps organize it is going to be referred to as chromatin. And that chromatin is highly organized, so it's the, it helps organize that DNA. Now, for the most part, you wouldn't be able to see the chromatin or the DNA with a light microscope because it's too thin. We talked about resolution with light microscopes. But when the cell is going to divide to make two new cells, the DNA needs to copy itself. So we need to make copies of chromosomes and, uh, and the DNA itself. So when we do that, if we're going to move 
the copies of our chromosomes or our DNA into two new cells. We got to pack them up tightly and coil them up. And as we coil them up tighter and tighter, they become thicker and thicker. And you can now see them with the microscope. So during cell division, they coil up and are called chromosomes. And this is the first time I'll probably introduce this in this course. The, the root of somes comes from the word soma, which means body. And chromo means color. So uh, the biologists that observe these chromosomes during cell division refer to them as stained or colored bodies uh, during the cell division. And that's where the, the term came from, chromosomes. Literally translates to stained or colored bodies uh, there. So um, if we look more closely at the nucleus again and look at a nuclear pore, you can see there's your inner membrane and there's your outer membrane and the pore itself. So this is one of those pores enlarged. The pore itself is a complex structure of other proteins that help maintain that pore there. And if we were to look at the surface of the nucleus, of the nuclear envelope, the outer surface of it, with a scanning electron micro, uh, microscope. Remember, that's the one that's going to scan the surface. It makes a three-dimensional image. You can see all the little pores that are there studded on there. Uh, and then this is a cross-section through um, the membrane and outside is the cytoplasm on this side in uh, that uh, grayish brownish color. And then on the inside is the inside of the nucleus and there's a nuclear pore there. So this would be the image on the right that's right here. That would be from a transmission microscope, a very thin section uh, uh, electron microscope. Now, if we were to go inside the nucleus, we were to shrink down and then we are small enough, we can go inside the nucleus, swim around in there. And we looked up at the surface of the inner membrane of the nuclear envelope this is what it would look like. And you can see this lattice-like network of protein fibers in there that help provide structural support for that nucleus. Uh, and I believe it's called the nuclear lamella, which means the nuclear layer, or la if you were to translate it. Uh, but there's uh, protein fibers on the inside, like, kind of like the ceilings and the walls of, of a room. Now, the ribosomes themselves, uh, those are organelles. They are not membrane-bound organelles. So both prokaryotes and eukaryotes have them. There's no membrane around them. They're going to be made of uh, the ribosomal RNA that we mentioned earlier, the rRNA, and some proteins. Okay? And together, these make your ribosomes. Okay? And so the ribosomes are going to be where protein synthesis occurs. Okay? Uh, now, these ribosomes are found in all three domains. They're found in the archaea, they're found in uh, the bacteria, and they're found in the eukarya, the eukaryotes. The thing about the prokaryote RNA is uh, the ribosome itself. It's actually smaller. Uh, and there are going to be some differences to distinguish uh, one from the other. And that's going to be important later when we look at some theories about where uh, mitochondrion comes from or a chloroplast comes from. They're very, very tiny and they look kind of like bacteria. And we're going to say, wow, OK, look at these coincidences. And it's probably more than a coincidence where they came from. But we'll talk about that in a future section. So remember that uh, the ribosome is made of a ribosomal RNA. This is how you spill it out, and this is how you abbreviate it. And it's a complex with proteins. So that's what we take a ribosomal RNA with protein complex. Now, in order to make proteins, you're going to need some other RNAs. You're going to need the messenger RNA. So you want to start uh, committing these to memory, and we abbreviate that mRNA. The messenger RNA is going to take the code when we're going to make proteins from your genes and your DNA, genes and DNA code for proteins. So we're going to make uh, 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 the code. We're going to copy that code into mRNA. It's like I'm going to, there's a code. I'm going to go visit the room where the code is, the nucleus, and I'm going to write down the code on a piece of paper. And that paper is the messenger RNA. Now I'm going to take those instructions and I'm going to go to the cytoplasm where we're going to take it to the ribosome to uh, make the, the protein. But you're going to need another form of RNA called the transfer RNA. And the transfer RNA are going to be like the workers bringing in the building materials to make the protein. And what are the building materials? The transfer RNA are bringing in the amino acids. Remember, the amino acids are going to be the ones that are put together into chains to make your primary polypeptide structure of a protein. And then that folds up to become your functional protein, right? So the ribosomes themselves uh, are going to be a uh, lot most likely free in the cytoplasm. And in eukaryotes, some ribosomes may be bound to internal organelles. And we kind of saw that uh, here 
when you look at, you can see the, there's red dots around the cytoplasm here in this animal cell. You can see them there if we're looking through the plasma membrane. But you can see right here on this endoplasmic reticulum, the blue one, it's studded with the ribosomes. It gives it a rough appearance, and they call that the, the rough uh, uh, endoplasmic reticulum. And that's associated with making proteins that are going to be uh, uh, kept separate from the rest of the cytoplasm. So you can see these little uh, string-like structures, there's a little polypeptide. Uh, chains that are going to go on to form uh, complex proteins. So section four of the chapter is going to be covering the endomembrane system. And the learning outcomes here are going to be to identify the parts of the endomembrane system. Again, I recommend sketching, labeling, uh, and then explaining what each of these uh, parts, their functions are and how they're related to, in this case, the endomembrane system. So uh, that's the second objective, is uh, to contrast what the functions are, and that means you, you know the structure and then explain what goes on in these parts. That's your second objective. And then we're going to look specifically at protein, a protein processing pathway uh, that are, can occur within the endomembrane system. Proteins can be made freely in the cytosol, the more fluidy part of the of the cytoplasm or within uh, uh, membrane-bound organelles like the endoplasmic reticulum. And we're going to take a look at that specific pathway there and see what happens to proteins that are produced there. So uh, what is the endomembrane system itself? It's going to be a series of membranes throughout the cytoplasm, and they are connected. And they'll be connected uh, indirectly at, at times. So some are directly connected. Uh, others, uh, little uh, uh, pouches called vesicles will bud off of them and then move to another uh, one of the organelles. And so we're taking membrane from one organelle in that little vesicle and it'll go to uh, and fuse into the next one. So that connects the membranes there overall. We'll see an illustration of how that works. Uh, so uh, these organelles, they're going to be compartments where you're going to have different cellular functions occurring. I talked about uh, separating different processes or metabolisms that are occurring within there. Uh, and this is a, a big distinction between eukaryotes and prokaryotes is the fact that eukaryotes can compartmentalize their metabolisms that go on within the cell. So uh, looking at your endoplasmic reticulum, I mentioned earlier when we were talking about the nucleus that it has a double uh, bilayer. And the outer membrane of the nuclear envelope actually begins to fold outward to form the endoplasmic reticulum. A lot of times it's abbreviated as ER, but in a lab exam, I might expect you to actually type out the entire word endoplasmic reticulum. Now, the rough ER, sometimes you'll see it uh, abbreviated that way. And again, know what ER stands for. It's endoplasmic reticulum, or RER. Uh, this one is going to appear rough because it's going to have ribosomes attached to it. And that gives you a clue what goes on in there. So if we take uh, the, the parts that are still uh, um, highlighted there and the parts that are faded out, we ignore them and we move them out here. There's your rough ER. That one folds out directly from the, endo, uh, from the outer membrane of the nucleus. And it looks rough in appearance because it's studded with ribosomes. So that's going to help you remember what goes on in there. If you know ribosomes is what makes the proteins, then what is made inside of the rough endoplasmic reticulum? Proteins. So here we're going to synthesize proteins. That's a function for it. And those proteins are either going to be secreted. That means they're going to be transported in a vesicle to the plasma membrane and then uh, let out of the cell. We may produce other organisms called lysosomes that are going to be bound inside of a vesicle or a bubble of membrane and stay there. Or you may produce stuff that becomes part of the plasma membrane uh, from there. So uh, that's your rough endoplasmic reticulum. And then if we were to take a thin section and do a transmission electron micrograph in blue, uh, you can see a cross section through the membranes, uh, the folded membranes of that uh, rough endoplasmic reticulum. The next endoplasmic reticulum is the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, and it is continuous. Uh, with the rest of the endoplasmic reticulum. It's, it's colored in green here, and you can see it in the cell model there. And it's going to tend to be in uh, not so much flattened uh, membranes, but more tubular in structure there. So when you cross-section through it, like you see in this electron micrograph, you see like you, you cross-section through little tube-like structures there. There are no ribosomes here, so this is not where uh, we're going to separate protein synthesis from the rest of the cytoplasm. And here, other things are going to be uh, done uh, in there. 
uh, and it's a synthesis here. Well, what kind of synthesis? For example, the synthesis of certain types of lipids uh, could are going to be produced in there. Uh, it could be used to store things like calcium, and that's done, for example, in uh, muscle cells of your body. And may also contain enzymes that help detoxify things that can be bad for uh, the cell. Uh, and the ratio of the rough endoplasm you're taking them to the smooth endoplasm you're taking them depends on uh, the function of that cell specifically. Like if it's in a multicellular body like uh, your cells and uh, the liver cells are going to have a lot, uh, a big role of liver cells is to detoxify things. And so in there you would expect to have more smooth endoplasmic reticulum than uh, rough endoplasmic reticulum. So moving on now to the next uh, organelle is the Golgi apparatus. And it is actually separated from the endoplasmic reticulum we were studying earlier. And it's going to have a cis face or a face that's toward the side facing the endoplasmic reticulum and then trans, which is the other side of it. So this would be the cis side and this is the trans side. Um, and it's going to resemble a flattened stack of uh, membranes there. And again, they're totally disconnected, but you can see this transport vesicle. This transport vesicle is coming here from either the rough ER, rough endoplasmic reticulum, or the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, and it's going to come in here and fuse in there. And the membrane itself of that vesicle came from the membrane of the rough or smooth ER. So that connects the membranes, and that makes the Golgi apparatus part of that endomembrane system. Here is a transmission micrograph showing the flattened stacks there. This is the ideal drawing here. Uh, the flattened uh, stacks of membranes uh, are referred to as Golgi bodies. So each one of these is a Golgi body. There's one, there's another one, a Golgi body. So it's the, each uh, flattened uh, structure is a Golgi body. Now the function there is to receive vesicles from the uh, endoplasmic reticulum and fuse in there. And then within there, further modification of what's in there. Let's say we're trying to make a protein. Uh, and the protein is not completely mature yet. It's not functional, but it goes in here and then gets processed further. The, the protein, the peptide, gets modified further. Uh, and then eventually a vesicle comes out the other side. And in this case, this might be a secretory vesicle for secretion. And that uh, vesicle is going to come to the plasma membrane here and fuse with the plasma membrane and let the stuff go. Think about that for a minute there. The membrane of the vesicle, which came from the Golgi body, is now going to go and fuse with the plasma membrane. So the plasma membrane is also part of the endomembrane system. It's not particularly emphasized here, but think about that. The membrane of the nucleus, the endoplasmic reticulum, the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, the Golgi and the plasma membrane are all part of the endomembrane system. So you want to make sure you list those again. Let me repeat that. The nuclear envelope both endoplasmic reticula, the Golgi apparatus, and the plasma membrane are all part of that endomembrane system. Uh, here we have, uh, remember the cis and the trans faces, the cis is the receiving side and the trans is the other side uh, of that. Um, so um, now the vesicles uh, that are uh, produced from there uh, may go for secretion. Uh, some vesicles may stay within the cytoplasm and function as other roles uh, that we'll talk about uh, a little bit later. So uh, let's take a look at an illustration diagram showing that process there. We can see that uh, here's your nuclear envelope in purple with the nuclear pores. The outer membrane of the nuclear envelope folds outwards to make the um, rough endoplasmic reticulum. And let's say now that one of the ribosomes there has produced a polypeptide, and the polypeptide is now right here, and it's going to produce or going to fold outward and pinch off uh, and bud off and form a transport vesicle. So now that transport vesicle is here containing the immature protein. It's not mature yet. It hasn't been folded. It hasn't, sometimes we got to cut it up and fold it and so on. But this transport vesicle is going to come and fuse uh, right here into the Golgi apparatus, and then uh, the material gets dumped inside. Now, as that uh, this uh, immature protein go, is going to go through changes in there. So the function of Golgi uh, apparatus is to receive, modify, and repackage on the other side. So we come in on the trans on the cis side here, and then we exit on the trans side, modified. And here in this case, they're showing a secretory vesicle for secretion. 
secretion is when we're going to release uh, important things to the environment. And so this vesicle will come now and fuse and release the material there that's going to go away and be used to maybe communicate with some other cells. Uh, and note that the membrane of the vesicle fuses with the plasma membrane, making the plasma membrane part of the endomembrane system. So looking at lysosomes specifically, lysosomes are another organelle found in there. They're involved in digestion. Intracellular digestion is a function there. Intra means within. Cellular within the cell. And when we digest, so intracellular digestion, remember we're going to be breaking apart larger molecules to smaller ones. And that requires putting water in. Remember, when we're going to break down larger molecules, we have to add a water. That's called hydrolysis. Okay? So in the lysosomes are proteins that are enzymes called hydrolytic or hydrolysis. They're hydrolytic enzymes that are going to help digest and break down larger molecules. Okay? So uh, going back to what we were covering in the prior slide in that transport within the membranes here, uh, enzymes are oftentimes they're going to be the made of proteins, so we're going to go through the same process. We we uh, get the instructions from the DNA. DNA sends an mRNA to the ribosome. Ribosome makes the polypeptide. We butt off here, come to the Golgi apparatus. The Golgi apparatus we're making the enzymes that are going to be packaged into a lysosome. Okay, and so. Uh, Instead, these vesicles are not going to come and go and fuse with the plasma membrane and be exported. Instead, the lysosomes stay within the cytoplasm, and they'll do things like fuse with worn-out organelles, like this uh, mitochondria is done. It's like broken. And so what's going to happen here is the two fuse together, and they form one larger membrane thing, and the enzymes spill in there and digest down and break down uh, the organelle. The other thing that the lysosome might do is when the cell does a cell eating, which is called, the, the term is there, is called phagocytosis. We'll do this, uh, we'll talk about phagocytosis in a future chapter when we look at transport uh, for cells. But basically, the cell takes in a, uh, uh, particles, maybe food, or uh, like white blood cells taking in bacteria, takes them in, uh, and then buds the plasma membrane and forms a food vacuole. And that vacuole then will combine with the lysosome right here to form a larger structure where the enzymes now are going to be digesting those materials. So that's sort of the things that lysosomes do, and there's that term phagocytosis, which literally transports to, uh, translates to mean cell E. Phagos means to eat, and cytosis is a cell process. So phagos means to eat. Okay. So uh, there are microbodies uh, that are part. So all of these, again, if you look at what a lysosome, where did it came from, come from? It came from the Golgi apparatus. So the vesicle itself, the membrane, is considered part of the endomembrane process. And uh, uh, Vesicles are very much a part of that. Then you have microbodies. The microbodies are going to be smaller vesicles here. Uh, and some microbodies like peroxisomes, which are colored in green in our ideal cell there. And then they went ahead and stained the electron micrograph. They went and they took a picture of a very thin section in a, in a transmission electron micrograph. And that's supposed to be one of these uh, little ones. So they're called microbodies. They're probably smaller, or on average, they're smaller than lysosomes. And they're going to contain enzymes that are involved in breaking down fatty acids. Okay? Fatty acids are made of, uh, or triglycerides are made of, and that process of uh, catalysis, that uh, hydrolysis or breakdown of those fats is going to produce a toxic compound called hydrogen peroxide. You might have heard of that. You pour it on cuts. It is toxic. It can kill bacteria. Hydrogen peroxide is very reactive and can destroy molecules within cells, and we don't want it to destroy important molecules in there. So, what are we going to do? We're going to have enzymes in there that help break down the hydrogen peroxide to something less harmful, like water and oxygen. An enzyme that does that is called catalase. And something that start uh, getting used to here is a lot of times enzymes, which are proteins that help speed up chemical reactions, and in the suffix ASE, catalase, amylase, uh, uh, alcohol dehydrogenase. Whenever you hear ASE, it's an enzyme that uh, 
helps facilitate chemical uh, metabolisms or chemical processes that occur in your cells and your metabolism. Then we have vacuoles. Vacuoles are going to be storage, and uh, I have uh, tried to put in a video here to see if it'll play. I'm going to click on it. It may not, but we'll get to it. This is a single-celled organism there on the bottom screen uh, called a paramecium. It has organelles that are vacuoles that uh, I'm going to mention here in a bit. But vacuoles basically are membrane-bound uh, structures that are going to store things or have other various functions. So there it goes. It's going to start playing there. Uh, and for this uh, microorganism, it's a protist. Uh, in the kina protista, it's a, uh, a eukaryote. And you're going to see, if it ever plays, you're going to see contractile vacuoles. And these are single-celled organisms that they live in, and it's a membrane-bound organelle that can contract or squeeze down. When you're a uh, single cell, you're going to see uh, there, uh, watch that, uh, oh, it's... The internet connection is a little rough right now, so it's playing off of YouTube. But this organelle right here, if it ever plays, you're going to see it shrink down. And the thing about this organism, it's single cell. It lives in fresh water. It's going to be taking in a lot of water, and it doesn't have a cell wall to keep it from bursting open. So the contractile vacuum is going to contract and push or eliminate excess water that's coming in. Okay, so it's uh, an organelle to help with water balance or homeostasis for water. Um, there, these vacuoles are membrane bound, just like uh, other structures within there, uh, and they do have various functions. Plants are going to have this large central vacuole that's going to be used to store water and uh, other materials in there. Um, and then there's other kinds of storage vacuoles. Your uh, fat cells called adipocytes have a vacuole. Uh, the video is playing now. You might be able to see the contract. Uh, it's still buffering. Um, the the adipocytes store fat uh, in their in their vacuoles, and so in our fat, we have fat cells that do that. So I'm going to go ahead and skip past this, uh, maybe another opportunity to see a video of contractile vacuoles working. But here's a picture of that plant cell going back to it again. You can see that large central vacuole there uh, in the middle there. It is bounded by a, a, a phospholipid bilayer. It's a membrane. Uh, and uh, here is an actual color-enhanced electron micrograph through a plant cell. And uh, this is that central vacuole right there. Uh, you can see the nucleus here, probably chloroplasts uh, uh, there, cell wall, and so on. And they went ahead and they colored, uh, colored in this to sort of match the color scheme in the diagrams there. But it, it's a rep it represents a, uh, a um, central vacuole, which is for storage in plants. So it doesn't look like that video is going to play, uh, and uh, that's unfortunate. But um, you could search up... Uh, Contractile vacuole and paramecium. That's the contractile vacuole. And you'll probably find some videos on YouTube that show really cool these organisms under the microscope doing their thing.